church. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to Christ Church United Methodist. My name is Beth Rambicure. I am the pastor here, and I serve with all of you, the ministers of this church. It is your actions, your prayers, your gifts, your service, your witness that makes this community what it is. So it is just a pleasure to have all of you here together to worship this morning. I have a couple of really quick announcements and then we will start our service of worship first. If you are with us for the very first time today, welcome! We're super excited to have you. After the service, if you don't mind introducing yourself to me on the way out, that would be amazing. That way when you come back next week, I can remember your name or at least try to. The second thing I want to let you know is if you would please fill out one of those welcome, uh, nope, it's not called that. It's one of the cards in the pews. Uh, all of you are invited to do that. Let us know that you are here today. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, you would like prayed over by the community throughout the week, please fill one of those cards out. If you have a private prayer request you would like prayed over by your pastor, uh, fill it out and mark it private, and I will pray over it throughout the week. The next announcement is, even though last week I said it would be a while before Mary Kundrat's service, I was wrong, which happens a lot. <laughs> Thanks, God. Um, so Mary Kundrat's service is going to be on Tuesday at 10 o'clock a.m. here in the sanctuary. We are also live streaming it, so feel free to catch it on Zoom or catch it here in person at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. The next announcement is actually from Karen. Karen, come on up and tell us what's going on. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Outdoor Ministry um, is planning a fall retreat, and it'll be on this Saturday from 3 to 8, and we are planning a whole bunch of stuff for you. Uh, well, one of the things is all that food that we're, you know, <laughs> we love to enjoy. So uh, I was just making up the uh, pulled pork, so I know that we're going to have pulled pork, and we'll have desserts, of course, and um, you know all those favorite salads. So I hope that you plan uh, to join us for all the festivities that we've got planned for you, and um, it would be great to see your faces there. Thank you, Karen. So that will be on Saturday the 27th at 28th at three o'clock. So I hope to see all of you there then. Our final announcement is we are indeed in the middle of our fall pledge campaign. But unlike your local radio station, we only mention it a couple of times during the service instead of the whole service, right? So please know that if you are praying over your pledge, uh, we're always happy to talk to you about it. We have additional pledge cards in the back. We ask that you turn those pledge cards in by November 12th so that we can put together our budget for the church. Although, as Candy reminded all of us this week, if you turn them in earlier, it's even better better because then we can do more planning in advance. With that, my friends, I welcome all of us to worship. Let us worship God together.
please rise for the call to worship. God of our forefathers and mothers, you take your people by the hand and hold them steadfast in the lost places of life. We reach our hands to you knowing you will guide us to your glory. Please remain standing for the hymn of praise, number 116, The God of Abraham Praise. Please be seated for the opening prayer. Loving, living God, be among us now. Guide our steps. Lift in us that we may be people of steadfast hope and powerful giving. Help us hear your words and share the glory of your presence with all the world. Holy One among us, let us be a holy people who receive your grace with joy and live your message in all that we do. Amen. Please find the scripture lesson in your bulletin and we'll read this responsively. This is from Psalms, the 99th chapter. It'll be on page 819. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. The Lord sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted over all peoples. 
Let them praise your great and wondrous name. Holy is the Lord. Mighty ruler, lover of justice, you have established equity. <laughs> Extol the Lord our God. Worship at the Lord's footstool. Holy is the Lord. Moses and Aaron were among God's priests. Samuel also was among those who called on God's name. They kept God's testimonies and the statutes God gave them. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. We are now going to turn 
to the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 1 through 6. And while they're taking their seat, I'm going to separate this into like three sections and give you a little context so we can understand a little bit better and definitely take something home from this book. Uh, so really, chapter 33, verses 1 through 6, God is really upset with the Israelites. Let's leave it at that. Uh, he's about ready to wipe them out. He's sharing this with uh, Moses. And uh, what's happened here in a nutshell is uh, the come out of um, Egypt, uh, they've taken the gold that they've collected in Egypt for those years and formed a, a calf, a golden calf, and are worshiping it as an idol. So they're being very unfaithful to the Lord, he's very upset, and uh, this is kind of how it goes here. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, Hittites, and Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. And if I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Harib. As we move along, uh, we go to verses 12 through 23, break it down into two sections. First section is really Things are going a little bit better between Jesus or, or the, the Israelites and Moses and the Lord. Uh, but Moses is asking the Lord, you, you need to go with me. You, I, we want you to go with us, the Israelites. I don't want to go and take these people alone. So Moses said to the Lord, you have said to me, take these people to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You say you're my friend and that I have found favor before you. Please, if this really is so, guide me clearly along the way you want me to travel so that I will understand you and walk acceptably before you. For don't forget, this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, I myself will go with you and give you success. For Moses had said, if you aren't going with us, don't let us move a step from this place. If you don't go with us, who will ever know that I and my people have found favor with you and that we are different from any other people upon the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, yes, I will do what you've asked, for you have certainly found favor with me and you are my friend. This last section is very interesting. It's talking about Moses asking to see God's glory. And basically here, it's portraying God with human characteristics, but we should not forget that God has a divine nature as well. And it's, 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 you'll, you'll see what I'm saying here. It's very interesting to think about. So this is really Moses asking to see God's glory. The Lord replied, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will announce to you the meaning of my name, Jehovah the Lord. I show kindness and mercy to anyone I want to, but you may not see the glory of my face, for man may never see me and live. However, Moses, stand here on this rock beside me, and when my glory goes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you shall see my back, but not my face. And so we have heard the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My sermon today is called Show Me Your Glory and is part three of our People Caring for People series. And as my mom asked me this morning when I read this sermon to her, um, what are you trying to say here? 
<laughs> and I came to the conclusion that I still haven't quite gotten to the point. But I think the scripture speaks for itself, so part of me just wants to sit down and say, Amen, Dick, we, we are done. Um, but we're going to give this a try. So how many of you would consider yourselves a little bit stubborn? Okay, a couple of you out there. I'm maybe more than a couple, like most of you, right? And how many of you would say that, like, you're really stubborn? Okay, there are a few of you out there. So I can identify with all of you who say you are really stubborn because that is my personality 100%. I'm like, if I'm on a track, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to keep going. That's what I'm going to do. And truly, I feel like you have to knock me upside the head to get me to change my mind and go a different direction. In fact, I'm in physical therapy right now for uh, dizziness, and the physical therapist keeps saying, you need to loosen up your neck. Your neck is really stiff. You know, you need to work on bending it and moving it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> It's part of my personality. It goes with my stubbornness. But sometimes being stubborn means that we get into trouble with the people we love the most. Sometimes being stubbornly committed to a course of action means breaking relationships that are incredibly important to us. Sometimes being stubbornly committed to who we are without being willing to change or consider adjustment means that we are no longer able to engage in the most fundamental part of what it means to be human, which is to give and take with another person, to live together. So this sermon reminds me, or the scripture we heard today reminds me, of those most heartbreaking arguments I've ever been in. Have any of you ever been in an argument with someone you love? <laughs> right? Never. I don't argue with anyone, Pastor. It's okay to tell the truth in church, friends. Right? I have been in all kinds of arguments. And now this one, I don't just mean an argument over what to have for dinner or whose turn it is to wash the dishes. Man, my sister and I used to argue about those kinds of things all the time, right? It's your turn to wash. I mean one of those serious arguments, the ones that cut to the very core of our identity, but we're not entirely sure why. The ones where suddenly our very heart feels like it's been stepped on and we don't know quite how to put ourselves back together. And suddenly words are said that can't be unsaid and actions are taken that can't be undone. Have you ever had an argument like that? Maybe. I've had a couple of those throughout my life with my family, with my friends, with colleagues, with peers. And in every case, it takes really hard work to put the relationship back together, no matter the love and history that lives between us. It takes a willingness to listen, a willingness to take responsibility, a willingness to be able to change. It takes time and energy. It takes love and grace. And as God repeatedly points out to the people of Israel, it takes a willingness not to be quite so stubborn and stiff-necked. At the heart of what God is doing in this whole entire book of Exodus is trying to craft relationships with human beings in a new and different way. Remember, we talked about a couple weeks ago that what God is doing when God gives the Ten Commandments is teaching the people that God wants to live with, wants to dwell among, how to treat one another and how to treat God. But it doesn't take very much for us to forget as human beings how to be good to one another. We sometimes lose sight of things like that. And last week, as Dick explained to us, we heard the story of how Israel smashed their relationship with God to pieces. And so chapter 33 is the beginning of the next step. It is the beginning of the reconciliation between God and Israel. And at the onset, it does not look good. God is truly and thoroughly sounding 
as if God is done with this relationship. God will fulfill the promises God has made because God's integrity relies on that. Because God's own name is at stake if God does not fulfill God's promises. But God is finished with the people. God is out of here. God will not go with them, will not maintain presence, will have nothing to do with them. Even God's language about what the people, about who the people are has changed. God says, go, leave this place, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. That's what God says to Moses. No longer does God say, my people, my children. No longer does God claim credit for the work of liberation that God has done. Now they are Moses' people. Moses' responsibility. Have you ever had that happen? I know that I have sometimes heard people say, that child of his, when they're talking about, you know, two spouses arguing about a child, I have heard that. Sometimes I will say to my mom, that daughter of yours about my sister, right? <laughs> I have nothing to do with that. That is not my responsibility. Here God is doing the same thing, putting distance between God's self and God's people. But then we know that somewhere at the foundation of what's happening here, is that God wants to do things differently. God doesn't necessarily want to destroy again. God wants to find a way to make this work. And so what we see here is the aftermath of a broken relationship. God hurt by Israel. God is hurt by their betrayal. The same way any one of us would be hurt by someone betraying and abandoning us. God is heartbroken. All of us know what it means to be heartbroken. And now the people are heartbroken as well because they recognize the consequences of their choices. In every argument we have afterwards, we recognize the consequences that both led us to that argument and then allow us to rebuild and do something different. This moment too marks the beginning of a new people for the, a new period for the people of Israel. The realization that their actions don't just have consequences for themselves and their neighbors, but truly do affect God and God's relationship, and that they can work to repair that relationship. Stewardship is, at its core, relationship. Our very first calling as created beings is to care for one another. That's also the place where we see the first fracture in relationship. Our second calling is to create care for creation, which also gets fractured in the beginning because human nature is fraught with things that break relationships. But if we are indeed created in the divine image of God, then just as it is God's nature to be in relationship and to reach out in ways that reconcile and heal, then it is our nature to do so as well, to cultivate those relationships with our own selves, with others, and with God that lead to and offer possibilities of healing. So then if stewardship is relationship, then it is also learning how to forgive how to apologize, how to take responsibility, and most importantly, how to change, how to find a way to be a bit more flexible. It is working to heal when things are broken. Israel models this for us, and instead of saying, fine God, you go your own way and so will we, have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. I know that I have probably said that to people I love very much. Instead of doing this, they take their first step in repairing the relationship by actually listening to God's complaint. Listening is one of the most important things we can do with one another. And not listening so we can advance our own argument or defense. Have any of you ever done that? You're listening and you're like, Aha, I caught gotcha. you. Now I get to prove my point even further. No, that's not what they do. They listen in a way that says, I agree, God, it's time to change. God says, take off your adornments, and so they do so. They take the second step, 
which is to take action that creates space for change. They take off the gold that they have brought out of Egypt, the gold that reminds them that they are conquerors, that they have power over the other nations in this world. They take those things off that they have used to turn into idols of power and worship as if they are the ones who've done the work of saving themselves from Egypt. And from the moment onward, that moment onward, they do not adorn themselves. This is the change that allows them to begin moving back towards God. It is true no matter the scale of brokenness we are discussing, whether it's disagreement about dishes or the furthest extremes we can think about, such as war. There is no peace if we are not willing to change, if the people around us are not willing to change, a willingness for those involved to move forward in a different way. Israel has made the commitment to this change and to be different this time around. And then, so does God. God is not off the hook just because God, God doesn't want to be involved anymore. Those of you who have been parents know what this is like. You don't get to just disown your children because you have a bad day with them when they're out or because you have a bad year with them, although it might be tempting. Moses reminds God that these are God's people. He says, see, you have said to me, bring up this people. Consider too that this nation is your people, reminding God that these people are God's people by God's own hand, and that this whole enterprise has been God's idea from the beginning. God cannot simply abandon these people now. Moses goes on to say, and to use his relationship with God to remind God that he too is the one these people are relying on. I know you by name and you have found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor with you, please show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. And God responds to Moses by assuring him, my presence will go with you. You will have rest and success in me. That's not what Moses is asking for. Moses isn't looking for assurance that God will be with him himself. He wants assurance that God will be with the people. If your presence will not go with us, God, Moses says, don't bring us up from here. It wouldn't do us any good. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and I and your people, unless you go with us. In this way, we shall be distinct in your people from every people on the face of the earth. And once again, Moses is reminding God of God's nature and inviting God to engage with God's promise. And so God, rather worn down by Moses' insistence, said, all right, I will do this thing that you have asked. You found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And then Moses goes on for what all of us truly want, that deep and abiding assurance of the power and the presence of God. Moses wants to see God's glory, wants to engage with all of God, to know God completely. Moses asks, please show me your glory. Let me see all of you. Let me know all of who you are. Give me ultimate assurance, O oh God, of who you are and what you can do. And this is always the place where God draws the line. God says, I will make my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you the name, my own name, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy, but you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And then God describes that God will pass by Moses and that Moses will see in part that glory of God. Show me your glory. One of the most important parts of any relationship is knowing when we have made an unreasonable request or when we hear what feels like an unreasonable request and know how to preserve our own integrity while maintaining that relationship. Theologically, what Moses is asking is impossible. 
God is mystery beyond human knowing and comprehension. We might see the glory of God in part, but to see God face to face, to know God wholly in this lifetime, it is not possible. Just as human beings cannot craft a God out of the things of the earth and cannot craft God's power, we cannot contain God in our knowledge. We cannot fully embody who God is. So as with all good relationships, God puts up a solid boundary and say, this far, but no further. God is God, and only God fully knows God's self just as Moses is Moses, and also cannot be God. In terms of human relationships, we can see here that if we are indeed made in the image of God, there are limits to what we can offer to do, both for ourselves and for others. There is a point at which we do need to say no, to remain who we are, and preserve our health and dignity, our sense of self. God offers Moses a compromise, you can see my glory in part, but not my face. Stewardship of relationships is indeed a sacred task. That is what Exodus is trying to teach us, that the way God cares for us must be modeled in the way we care for one another, in the way we are willing to be flexible and change, and to be people caring for people is how we participate in the full glory of God, even if we can only see part of that glory in this lifetime. For what is that glory? God says God's by, from God's own mouth that it is God's mercy, God's graciousness, God's slowness to anger, God's steadfast love and faithfulness, God's forgiving of inequity, transgression, and sin. These things are God's glory. And so when we do those things with one another, when we are merciful, when we are slow to anger, when we are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, when we are willing to forgive transgression and sin and iniquity, then we are participating in that kind of glory. You and I may not be able to stop the breakages of relationships that happen throughout this world. We can't fix someone else's relationship. We can't stop wars and we can't stop global violence. But friends, right here between us, you and I, we can participate in our own relationships, in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods, indeed in our state and in our nation in a way that facilitates reconciliation and opens doors for healing, in a way that makes listening and change the core of what we do, and that takes seriously the concerns of others while maintaining the boundaries of our own integrity. We can do these things even though they are not easy. Indeed, it is the hardest work we do, but friends, that is our calling why God shaped us as God's people so that we could be people caring for people, participating in forgiveness, mercy, and graciousness so that all may see the glory of God. Amen. Amen.
as the spirit of the living God falls afresh on us, let us go before God as a community in prayer. Will you pray with me? Eternal and gracious God, you are indeed merciful and steadfast in your love. You set the first example of what it means to reach out, to change, to listen, and to be present for one another. Teach us how to do likewise to ourselves and in all of the relationships we are engaged in, in all of the places of brokenness and hurt that are in our lives. Let us be people of mending, people who bring about healing, people who indeed know and teach what it means to participate in your wholeness and in your holiness. Lord God, we lift up to you today as a people engaged in prayer together, those prayers that are on our hearts and minds. We speak them aloud to you in this time, knowing that you hear and answer us even before we speak. Hear these, the prayers of your people. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. 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 in your mercy. Hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. God, you hear all of these prayers and all that are not spoken today. You are with us in our own struggles when we struggle with addiction, when we struggle with depression and mental illness, when we struggle with loneliness, when we struggle with questions of how to reconcile what seem like impossible relationships. You are with us as our peacemaker. You are the one who reaches into our lives and makes all things possible, including healing our own souls and mending our own brokenness. For these things, O oh God, we give you thanksgiving. And we lift up to you, O oh God, all those places in our world today where brokenness is running rampant. We lift up to you, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. We lift up to you, Ukraine, and the people of Russia. We lift up to you, O oh God, all those places where conflict and war makes it practically impossible to love one's neighbor. And we ask that you use us as instruments of peace, that you continue to be engaged in this world in ways that bring about healing and wholeness to all your people, so that all might truly know the great grace and reconciliation of your love. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who ultimately reconciles us with you. Amen. My friends, having prayed together, now let us be bold to confess our sins together as we pray together this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not given you the things that are yours. We quibble over technicalities and argue over questions that do not lead us to love you, ourselves, or our neighbors well. 
We ignore your goodness that is all around us, and we do not allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit who empowers us to live as people who glorify you. We do not recognize your holy touch in the world around us, and we neglect our sacred responsibility to treat all things and people as sacred. Forgive us, we pray. Free us to live in love and peace with you and with ourselves and with our neighbors and with all your glorious creation. Amen. My friends, hear this good news. God walked upon this earth sharing our human life in Jesus Christ. God has conquered sin and death, forgiving us all through love and grace. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth, earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, having prayed together, confessed together, received God's grace together, let us rise and share signs of peace and welcome with one another. And now, my friends, as we gather back together, I invite you to turn to the cameras and those who are joining us online and offer a hearty peace be with you to all of them. Peace be with you. My friends, community is made possible because of the relationships we have with each other. And one of the most important instruments of that relationship is the way we engage in music together. And so I'm going to invite Janet and Sina to share a few words in our stewardship moment about the music ministries of Christ Church. In this room are two of the finest instruments in Tucson our wonderful sugar pipe organ, and the beautiful Steinway piano. Next spring, I will celebrate the honor of playing these amazing instruments for the past 15 years. I try to remember, <laughs> I try to remember to thank God every time I enter this sacred space for the privilege of having this opportunity. And I also need to thank you First of all, for taking a chance on me in 2009, for fairly compensating me, and for your curation of these instruments in the sanctuary and a couple of other places on campus. The primary expense with the instruments is for the tuning and maintenance, and your tithes and offerings make this possible. I purchased my own glasses, <laughs> my own organ shoes, and my own music but your gifts are needed to keep the organ and piano in good working order. If the instruments were not tuned, you probably would soon notice, <laughs> and you would cringe. I cannot tune the piano or the organ. That requires professionals, and we have two wonderful technicians who come in at least twice a year and get those jobs done. Long after you and I are gone, and the piano and organ will continue to bring joy and praise with somebody else on the benches, maybe some different faces in the pews, and being good stewards today 
makes that possible for the future. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I think this is my third time standing here, so that means I'm, it's on my third year. Here. Yay. <laughs> So I just want to say, like, every time we gather to worship um, in this room, we know we experience um, beautiful worship from our pastor and from Janet, the bells, and the choirs. So we know that music is not merely an accompaniment, but it is a vibrant expression of our devotion, um, a call to stewardship that echoes through the hymns and melodies that grace our sanctuary. So consider the hymns we sing, the psalms that resonate through these hallowed walls. They are more than words set to music. Um, they are the heartbeat, the heartbeat of our collective spirituality. So an invitation to embody the principles of stewardship in every note and harmony. So our songs, like prayers, have the power to inspire, uplift, and unite us as stewards of God's grace. In singing together, we form a choir of believers. We are those choir. We are the believers. And each voice a unique instrument in the symphony of our worship. So stewardship, therefore, extends beyond our financial contributions. It encompasses the offering of our talents, our voices, and our dedication to God itself that binds us together. As stewards, we are not only entrusted with the care of this sanctuary, but also with the responsibility to enrich the worship experience through the gift of music. So just as the parables in scriptures teach us valuable lessons, the notes and lyrics of our hymns convey messages of love, compassion, and gratitude. So when we listen to melodies, these are sermons and harmonies that are prayers, recognizing that our music is a powerful medium through which we communicate with, the, with God and with each other. So as we give our offerings, let us also remember to give to the choir, the organ, the bell choir, and of course, the entire music ministry. Um, in doing so, we invest not only in the maintenance of this sacred space, but in the spiritual growth and enrichment of our community. Um, our musical gift is an integral part of our commitment to the flourishing of our church family. So we thank you for all that you have um, given us for the choir itself. So we see we have a lot of guests every time. And that goes, your gift or our blessings goes to our guest musicians and the music that we sing to you every Sunday. So we thank you for that. And so I end this, I know I took time to make this, but in the spirit of worship and stewardship, let our music be a harmonious expression of our dev devotion to God and our commitment to one another. Thank you. Woo. My friends, I have nothing to add to that except that at this time, we have raised $64,850 towards our total, which is 19%. We only need 81% more or $285,000 to reach our pledge total of $350,000, every single cent of which goes towards investing in all of the ministries that are, that are brought to you every day. And so with that, let God use us as instruments of God's peace and grace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
receive these, the gifts of your people, O oh God, and use each of us the most important gift you give to this world so that we might be your hands and feet of peace and reconciliation. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, I invite you to remain risen as we sing hymn number 731, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. I invite you to turn to one another and share with each other this benediction. Go forth today as people caring for people in living a life patterned after God's grace. You may share the hope, joy, forgiveness, and love you receive from God with your neighbors wherever you go. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the postlude. 